just want to also give my warmest welcome to you guys. I would imagine that in a, in a room this size, there is a variety of, of heart postures walking in this store. Maybe you were brought by a friend and you're like, I haven't been to church in a long time. I don't know a lick about the Bible, but I'm here and I like my friend. You are welcome in this space. Um, maybe this has been your home for a long time, but you're, you're wrestling with some things. Maybe you would like God's calendar to line up with your calendar, and you're kind of frustrated by that. You are welcome in this space. Maybe you carry some burdens. You got some heavy things walking in this door, and you're wondering, is there a space for me with all these heavy things? Yes, you are welcome in this space. I just want to say I'm really thankful that every person came today. It's not by accident. So really grateful to be here today. So I am excited because I want to look at quite possibly my favorite human in the Bible this morning. She happens to be a woman. Um, she's a mama. She's a, a mother of three. And um, the more I read about her and the different commentaries and the different things and just sit in the story of, of who she is, I'm like, man, she is highly underrated. Like, I'm talking like Scottie Pippen on the Bulls team, like 1988, <laughs> underrated, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so her, what's fun about her story is that uh, when we look at her, her story has a lot of anxiety, decision-making, and then some places where she really would want to control the whole thing. Does that resonate with anybody? Does anybody feel like they could fall into any of those categories? <laughs> yes, okay, this woman's name is Jochebed. And I didn't, this is Moses' mom. I didn't know, I didn't know her name forever. Did you guys know that Moses' mom had a name? Of course she did, but you, you didn't. Now here's what's fun. Nora, right? This is Nora. Sammy's, oh my gosh, okay. She knew who Jochebed was. These little, little babies, Sammy's, I'm like, when's she going to be up here preaching? That's what I want. Pass her the mic. Um, okay, Jochebed is her name, and we're going we're gonna to pick up in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. So there's 66 books in the Bible. We're going to be in Exodus, and we're going to be talking about Jochebed. Now, here's a few things about her. She has, she's a mom of three, and Moses, if you don't know anything, I'm sure you've heard if you're like, I don't, I really don't know much about the Bible. Maybe, can we, have we heard of Moses? We got to, yeah. yeah, we got him. okay. Moses was the baby though. You guys know that? There were three kids. At first, it went, the oldest is Miriam. Raise your hand if you're the oldest in your family. We got some oldest people. Yeah, so you're responsible. You like to be on time. Perfectionist issues maybe, is this? Okay, you are, so whenever you see Miriam, who's the oldest, just put yourself in your shoes oldest, and you're like, this is my time to shine. You will see, Miriam is a star role in here. Okay, but then you got the, you got the middle child. Who, do we have any middle kids in the room? Yeah, represent! You are often overlooked, is that? <laughs> You, you, need to, you need to make your way. You got to get some attention going on. But you're really good socially, right? So that's Aaron. Not really. No, I bet you are. Aaron. Aaron is the middle. Okay, now, true, true to form of the middle child, Aaron does not show up at all in this part of the story. So, <laughs> so sorry, middle kid. And then we've got baby Moses. Who's the baby in the family? Who are the babies? Same. We got the babies, right? All right. We are, we're, we're a load of fun. We're charming. We're self-centered. I mean, there's like a lot <laughs> going on with Moses. And yeah, so you're going to, so I want you guys to find your place in the story today, okay? So you'll, you'll, you'll see where you, you fall. Now, just a little quick context of where we are here in Exodus. Um, the Israelites are living in Egypt, and they keep growing. They keep making babies. They're growing, and, they're, and it's, it's like a packed house in Egypt. And, but they're not being ruled by an Israelite. They're, they're being ruled by Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he's threatened by how big Israel is getting. And he's like, um, they could, he, he's feeling insecure. They could rise up. And so this is the scene where we are right here in Egypt with the Israelites, um, Okay, let's start. Oh, one more thing. We're going to have some fun. Whenever you see on the screen some purple words of scripture, can we all read them out loud together? Yeah. Would that be good? Yeah. So you don't fall asleep on me? That'd be... All right. Okay, here we go. 
Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Puah. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. Oh, right? I know. If it is a girl, let her live. But because... I've feared God. Okay, we'll get this. They refused to obey the king's orders, and they allowed the boys to live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. He's like, why have you done this? What's going on? He demanded, why have you allowed the boys to live? And the Hebrew women are, and this is what they respond. They say, oh, king, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies you're doing this. Good job. That they, we cannot get there in time, right? So they give their excuse. So God was to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Of their own. Oh, thank you. Well done. Here's the, here's the thing. I just want to pause right here. These two midwives... We're like, we are not doing this. We are bringing life into the world. But here's what's interesting. These women were put in charge of bringing life into the world, but they did not have families of their own. And they feared God, and they chose God over the fear of man. And because of that, God saw them. He must have heard their plea to have their own babies, and he was good to them, and he gave them families of their own. Isn't that sweet? Isn't he good? Yeah, we just, we just got to pause at that. All right, we'll look at this last section, and then we'll chat a little bit. It says, then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people. So first he goes to the midwives. They don't obey. He's like, fine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this like a law of the land here. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. All right, so obviously this takes a dark turn. It gets better. If you don't know what happens. But this is, this is a hard moment. Can you imagine if you are pregnant and this law goes out? Can you imagine thinking, oh, what if we have a boy? What are we going to do? And this is Pharaoh, again, another way of oppressing the, the Israelites. He doesn't want them to grow. He's insecure about his kingdom. He doesn't want an army of boys rising up against him. And this is where we meet our girl, Jochebed. All right, here we go. Let's move on. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman, her name is Jochebed, she's named later, became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and, yes, for three months. All right, this is a woman between a rock and a hard place. Am I right? She's like, oh, no, no, this is my son. And she's, she's kept him hidden as long as she can, but he's growing, and he's getting louder, and he's probably not sleeping through the night right now. He's just having a brain leap or whatever, you know. It has. She's thinking, what am I going to do with, with, with my son? And, and the orders, and she's stuck. And I imagine that not only she's, she's feeling pretty stressed, she's feeling anxious, and she's wondering, what choice do I have? What decisions do I have? And I imagine she's reaching for control in any way she can. And I know you might not be in this situation. You're not. You're not joking about it right here. But maybe you identify with the feelings that she could be feeling. Helpless, stuck, anxious, looking at what agency do I have in this moment. Does that resonate or speak to anybody? You can feel this in your life right now. Maybe you just feel out of control in a certain situation. You feel stuck. And the question is, in a moment like this, when we're looking at Jochebed and where she is, anxiety has the opportunity to starve her soul. Anxiety about the future. What's going to happen? Playing the what-if game at 3 a.m. Does anybody wake up and play the what-if game all of a sudden? Oh, I can gold medal in that game if you want to go head-to-head. Like, what if this happens? What if this? And you're sweating, and you're like, oh, my. That anxiety and that stress that wakes you up. What's the solution when anxiety wants to starve our souls in moments like this? Let's see what happens. What does Jochebed do? Again, we're going to take great, you know, we're going to take some things away from her faith. Here we go. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and 
with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it. Along the reeds. Yes, along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then. I don't hear everybody. I'd love to hear everybody. I hear so it is watching to see what would happen to him. All right. It seems to me in this anxiety inducing situation, she asked herself two questions. What is mine to do? And what is God's to do? Right? What is within my control and that God is asking me to do? And then what is only something that God can do? This, she's looking at this, these are the two questions she's asking, right? And I think even in the grace in that idea, that question of what, what is mine to do in this situation? God is a with us, God. So even if you look and you say, oh, okay, I think this is mine to do, we're not doing it alone. We're doing something with God. And then we let God, we let the outcomes, the results up to him. So Jochebed, clearly she decides there are three things she can control in this situation. Three things within her power, her agency. And so what she does, she, she prepares a basket that's in her control. She decides on the placement of her baby. And then she decides on the position of her oldest. This is within her power and control. Now, here's what's fun, you guys. Jochebed is brilliant and strategic and resourceful. As you see what she did. She's, she's, she's amazing. And it shows us we can take action and trust God at the same time. We don't have to put our brain on a shelf if we want to have faith in God. Like he's given us skills and resources and powers to use with him. And he says, go, go for it. Go for it, Jochebed. So she decides to prepare a basket. Now, I don't know. Are you guys familiar with tar and pitch? Like, what's going on with these things? I, did, I, had, I had a deep dive. I'm like, pitch? What's happening? It's waterproofing. That's, you know, tar on a roof, all the things. So she waterproofed the basket. Pitch is thicker than tar, so that one on the bottom, tar in the middle. I mean, all the, the Noah Ark vibes right here. She's making a little ark so that, that this papyrus basket will, will float. So she prepares a basket, and then she decides on the placement of her baby in the basket. Do you guys remember? You read it out loud. Where does she put the basket? Among the reeds. Is anybody familiar with the DreamWorks movie, Prince of Egypt? You guys, like it's, it's, yeah, back there. Okay, so they are very dramatic about baby Moses going through. I mean, I mean, there are like hippos that he passes, almost passes through. And there's like, there's a ship that he's like just narrowly misses it. It's like all these waves. Are okay. It is completely false. <laughs> it makes for a fantastic movie, but that's not how this goes down. And in fact, I'm a little mad about it because it takes away all Jochebed's resourcefulness and skill and her decision making about what went on here, but it's fine. Um, she places him among the reeds. So, I mean, literally, she's just is like, okay, here's the tall, leafy grasses. Things will get stuck in here. I'm going to put my baby, and, it, and he won't go down the Nile. He's going to get stuck right here. Very resourceful, very purposeful, very smart. Um, and then we'll see in a minute the place on the Nile where she chooses to put the basket. Is, is very strategic, where, where he's located. Um, and, then, and then she position, positions her oldest daughter. Oldest, think about this, you're coming in. She, she's going to put, now Miriam is around between 12 and, and 15 at this point. So, so she's got some responsibilities. She decided to put Miriam to watch. And, and oldest, you are on time, you've, you've timeliness. And so she's like, I'm going to count on you. If you see an, an opportunity, please step in, Miriam. So this is what she, this is how she sets. Now, here's the thing. After she does everything she can do, she makes this basket. She prepares it. She positions the placement. Then she has to take her hands off the basket. She has to take her hands off the basket. She has to let go of her baby boy. In the same way that some of you mamas have had to hug your kids and then let them go and get on a bus and you don't know about their day for six hours. You don't know who's saying what, who could be bullying. You have no idea. The same way, we won't even go with motherhood, just as a person, maybe you're working on a project 
at work, or maybe you've got a relationship that you're trying to work. Maybe you're in some job situation, something that you really care about, that you treasure so much. There's a moment where you're, put, you're doing what you can do, but then you've got to take your hands off the basket and let God do what only he can do. And I don't know what that is for you right now, but man, she had, a, she had to trust God. She had to do what she could do and then trust him to do what he could do. This happened to me a few months ago. My oldest son got into a car with another teenager, just the two of them. And they were in charge of the car. <laughs> like there was no other adult. There was no one driving but another teen. And he gets in. And I'm like at the door, like I'm like watching like this. And they're like driving away. It was the first time I saw one of my children drive away with another child. And I had to take my hands off the basket. And trust God. I really wanted to climb in the trunk, but that's not cool. (laughs) How many times has God said, you do what you can do, and you have this conversation with them, but there's a moment where you're like, i got to trust you. i got to take my hands off the basket. Right? Now, for us, I don't know if this, this will speak to you guys, but for us, I feel like there's two extremes that we can fall in when it comes to an anxiety-inducing situation. On one extreme, when you're in this moment, you're like, what what should I do? You might fall into this camp, which is the forget it camp. I can't do anything. There's nothing. for God's going to do what he's going to do anyways. I'm I'm not going to eat ice cream or just sit here. I can do, I'm going to throw out my hands. The forget it mode. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're just like, whatever. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum over here, this is where I tend to lead this, this is the uh, I'm going to fix it yeah, no. mode. I'm going to make some calls. I'm going to send some emails. I'm going to overreach. I'm going to cross all the boundaries. I am going to get after this. I am a recovering control freak. Like this is a fix it mode on the other extreme. Does this resonate with anybody? Just me? No, a few of us. So we've got these extremes in these moments where you, you're going to fix it white knuckle it, or you're going to say, forgive it, and hands up. But I'm going to propose to you, the way we see Jochebed is this middle way. This is faith mode, where she invites God in to this moment. And she says, God, will you, can we, can we talk about this? Is there something you want me to do? And then what do I need to trust that only you can do? Because in these extremes, we're usually not inviting God in. But faith would invite him into this anxiety-inducing situation. I want to encourage you to do that. If you're stuck, if you're feeling helpless, you're not sure what to do, say, God, can you show me what's next? Can we do this together, you and I? Faith mode. All right, I want to see what happens with Jochebed. What does this look like? How does she handle this? Let's keep going here. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked alongside the riverbank. So she chose the princess is going to walk in this area of the Nile. When the princess saw the basket, she sent her maid to get it for her. And when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and all the compassion, all the pity rises up. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approaches the princess, oldest, come in, this is your time, this is your cue, Miriam. She says, oh, hi, hi, I was just in the reeds. Um, should I, it's good to see you, princess. Um, should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to come and nurse this baby? Like just, you know, and she, and, and the princess says, yes, please do. I don't know where you came from, by the way, but sound, yes. Can you do that? So the girl went and called the baby's mother, which is her mama. This is Jochebed. She goes and gets Jochebed. Take, and then, now here's the thing. Here's the princess, and here's here's Jochebed having a conversation. She finds her mom. She comes back, and she says, take this baby and nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, I will pay you for your help. Bonus. (laughs) That was, like, not a thing, like, an hour ago. Um, I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home. 
and nursed him. It does not get better than this story. You know what I'm saying? Can we give God, I mean, this is like, you can't, you can't write this stuff, right? I mean, Miriam steps in, how beautiful, but how amazing. Here's a, a few observations. I don't know about you, but often we see people who grow up in, in houses under their parents, they, they, send, they tend to adopt the same ideologies and ways of thinking, maybe political views, right? You make some little, sometimes some copies. Well, this, the prince, so the princess has been growing up with a dad that said every Hebrew boy should be thrown, should, should drown. And God did what only he could do and changed this princess's heart in that moment. I mean, when she took her, when Jacob had took her hands off the basket, she was counting on God, would you work in somebody's heart in this situation? Because I can't change hearts. Would you do something that I cannot do, God? I bet she didn't imagine that Pharaoh's daughter would be the one to take Moses out of the water and, and save the baby, right? I, I think that would have not but crossed her mind. She did everything she could do. And she watched God do what he could do. I'm thinking about their dinner table that night. They're passing around baby Moses. Now, Aaron's about three, so he's like diaper running around. He doesn't know what's going on. He's like, Moses is bad. I mean, what's, but they're passing around. And Miriam was like, and so then when I was like way back here and I saw the princess, I like stepped in. I was like, hi. And they're just like reliving it. And just like jokes on Pharaoh. Like how beautiful that he was returned it's the sweetest. It's such a faith-building moment. And I got to tell you guys, she's going to need this evidence of God's faithfulness. Jacob is going to need the evidence. This is why. And this is a part of the story that gets me every time. And maybe you don't know this part. It's still shocking to me. We're going to read the end of this. How do I know she's going to need this? Look at this. It says, the text says, later, when the boy was older, we're not sure. It could have just been a couple years his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Okay, so yes, Moses was restored to his mother's arms. And yes, she was able to raise him for a few years. And yes, she did not have to watch her boy suffer. But, but some kind of deal had been made. Some kind of conversation happened that we're not privy to. We're not really sure. But the princess and Jacob had had some words. The princess must have paid her to say, I will pay you to nurse this child, but then bring him back. I'm going to raise him as mine. This is hard. And I think about how many times with Jochebed, as she's rocking Moses, putting him to bed, how many times would anxiety want to starve her soul about her son's future? Going to live under the Egyptian house. How many times would she have to say, okay, God, I know that back here you were good, and I know that you were good, and you were good. And so when I see these question marks and question mark, question mark, I'm going to fill them in with you will be good, and you will be good, and you will be good. She will count on his past faithfulness for his future goodness. And we are going to need to do that, friends. We're going to need to practice often. Okay, where was God good? Just what, what Sam was saying, his fingerprints all over. Where was he good? Because I'm not sure about this future. I'm unsure. This place feels hard. It's uncertain. It feels scary and dark. Okay, I'm going to go back here. He was good, and he was good, and he was good. So he, he will be good. I imagine one of her prayers, putting myself in her shoes at night, one of the ways she practiced this is that she would say, she would say, I, I trusted God with my baby in a river. I will trust God with my boy in a castle. And she would practice trusting God. And I'm saying practice because I'm not very good at it. I need to practice trusting him for what's going on to practice. Friends, we, we have the end of the story. We know who Moses becomes. 
we know that he's the guy to lead everyone out of captivity, out of slavery. He gets to talk face to face. He gets to bring the law. We know the kind of man. Jochebed did not know. She did not know the end of the story. And we're in the same boat when it comes to our kids, our future, our lives, our jobs, our hopes. Our we do not know. But we can follow in her footsteps and practice believing God will be good because he has been good in the past, right? So sometimes I need a little help when it comes to this idea of trusting God and control and anxiety and all the things. So I wanted to leave you guys with this prayer. It's a a prayer from a Franciscan priest. His name is Murray Bodo, and it's very simple, and it's a morning prayer, and it's really beautiful. And take a screenshot or however you want to do it, but this is his prayer. It starts here, I am not in control. (sighs) Right? Amen. Like, that's just it. I am not in control. I am not in a hurry. I walk in faith and hope. I greet everyone with peace. And I bring back only what God gives me. Take it or leave it. It's been an anchor for me the last three months. Some just different things that I'm praying through and working through. This is the last thing I want to close with. I don't know if you guys, band, you can make your way up. I don't know if you guys, when you think about the treasures in your life, the things you really treasure, the people, the situation, the job, and you're like, you know what? If I hold on to these treasures, I think they'll be pretty safe. They'll be good. But if I'm going to hand them to God, I'm kind of forgetting about his name and his nature. Is he good? Like, what will he do with my treasures? And several chapters later in Exodus, there's a moment where God is speaking to Moses and he reveals his character. And he gives five attributes. This is the first time God reveals his character to Moses. And it is a refrain over and over in the Psalms and the prophets. You see it over and over. And it's Exodus 34, 6. And it says this. This is the Lord in third person. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. This is who he is. This is what his hands are like. His hands are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. He does not have a short fuse, my friends. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Overflowing. Like he has copious amounts of love and faithfulness. He's not running out when it comes to you. This is, that is a scripture I go back to when I think about my future. I'm like, what are his hands like? If I'm gonna, ha- if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna take my hands off the basket, Okay, I can trust a God who is compassion forward, who is gracious, slow to anger, thank goodness, faithful, loving. God, thank you for this morning and every woman, man, kiddo, baby in this room. Thank you that we can look at the faith of Jochebed, a mom who had her hands full and had to make some hard choices over and over hard choices and you see that she trusted you and and the beautiful person her son grew up to be god would we be people of faith would you would you take the mustard seeds of faith in this place and would you multiply them would you grow our faith Would you help us to look behind us and say, okay, goodness and mercy is following me, so I know goodness and mercy is going to be over here. Lord, teach us, show us. You are good and we worship you. Amen.